Amina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table and today as always we have a wonderful show lined up for you today and it's going to sound like such a serious thing but hopefully we can talk about it in a much more engaging way as we are wont to do on this show but today we're going to be talking about diabetes in Pakistan and around the world but more specifically diabetes in children which is actually surprisingly um, very complicated and also kind of simple and you know I'm going to let the doctors tell you all about this actually <laughs> stop interfering <laughs> so joining me today on set is Dr. Sumaya Aftab she is an assistant professor of pediatric endocrinology and diabetes at the Children's Hospital and the Institute of Child Health she's got an MRC, MRCPH from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in the United Kingdom and joining me across the internet we are delighted to welcome back to the show once more our favorite Dr. Tanya Sumro who is a consultant pediatrician in general and developmental pediatrics at the Lahore Children's Center and is also an MRCPH and a fellow of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health so a distinguished illustrious lady doctors with me today hi Dr. Aftar hi Mina how are you I'm very well as you can see full of beans very excited to talk to you, you look very nice about today. diabetes yeah. <laughs> now I always find it really um, strange how excited again yeah. about things that sound otherwise very dull yeah. but it is quite exciting <laughs> so tell me like as I like to say we're gonna begin from the beginning what is there's a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes generally so what yeah is so Mina because actually what happened I know this is a very interesting question to ask because most of the people most of the parents they have no idea that type 1 and type 2 diabetes they are totally different entities yes and if I'm going to talk about typically about type 1 diabetes, mm. it is can also called as juvenile diabetes right. or you can say the diabetes in children because mm. somehow more than 90% of the children who are having the diabetes, they were having type 1 diabetes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that is why we are more specifically going to talk about yes. the diabetes in children. <laughs> so type 2 diabetes is something which we normally saw in our parents, in our grandparents, mm. they appear mm. in later age and uh, you know the etiology the underlying reason is totally different it mm. is something in which the patient they are producing insulin but somehow the insulin is not working properly and that is why we normally supplement by certain drugs which can make this insulin to work properly but in the case of type 1 diabetes mm. the things are totally different because yes. these children they are not producing insulin At or all. they are producing very really little amount of an insulin oh. so that is why this is totally different thing wow. and Type 1 diabetes is supposed to be managed by giving shots of insulin. Okay. So hmm. This is something which is, I really feel everyone need to understand hmm. that type 1 diabetes cannot be managed by giving certain medications because right. we cannot somehow force pancreas to produce insulin because hmm. their pancreas is almost 60 to 70 percent already being destroyed when they presented to us. Oh. So they need insulin actually. Oh gosh. Yeah. I know it's difficult scary. thing, it sounds scary, but yes. uh, to be very honest, this is very important to understand mm -hmm. because the late presentation can have some very bad consequences and we really want to avoid it actually. Quite right. Yeah. And you know, we're going to delve more into yeah. this. Hi, Dr. Sumro, can you hear me? Hello, hello. I'm feeling very left out on Zoom and not sitting <laughs> on your sofa, Mina. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Sumro. Yes. We're missing you terribly also, but you know, needs must. <laughs> So as Dr. Afta mentioned, type 1 diabetes is juvenile diabetes, which is the diabetes that children get. So is there a sort of average age in which uh, type 1 diabetes presents in children? You know, for type 1 diabetes, it's interesting because actually until the 1990s, you know, in kids, we almost only saw type 1 diabetes. So it was like 95% of cases were type 1. But recently because of you know obesity in children we're seeing a lot more cases of type 2 in kids oh. and actually what we find is that yeah so the kids with type 2 are usually like you know your overweight adolescents hmm. whereas kids with type 1 die typically present when they're younger right so maybe sort of between you know um, five to eight years of age, that sort of thing. Mm. And what we're also seeing is that before, it used to be very rare to see kids coming in, you know, and being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when they were under five years old. Mm. But that's another thing that we've been seeing a lot more of recently. Why do you think that is? Because from what I understand, type 1 diabetes is actually an autoimmune condition, which blew my mind on many levels. Mm. Yeah, and, and the thing is that autoimmune conditions generally are rising, right? So if you look at any mm. autoimmune condition, generally the incidence is going up. Mm. And with type 1 diabetes, there's a very strong genetic 
element to it. Oh. So, you know, if you have, um, yeah, and actually, you know, what's really interesting is that if you have a father who has type 1 diabetes, uh, uh. then the child has about a 10% risk of mm. developing type 1 diabetes. But if the mom has type 1 diabetes, then the child only has a, like an about a 4% risk. Oh, so that's that wow. really interesting. That is really, really interesting. I'm on those white chromosomes causing trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. So, <clears throat> Dr. Aftab, you are a pediatric endocrinologist. Exactly. So what does that mean also? Yeah, this is really important thing to know because <laughs> like, most of the people, they have no idea about pediatric endocrinology. Yeah. So to put it in a simple thing, we are the doctors who basically deal with uh, managing the hormonal problems of the children. Right. And unfortunately, there are a lot of hormones in our body and each yeah. hormone is performing a specific job. Yeah. So the spectrum of disease that we normally used to see, it's very really varied. Like mm. we are dealing with the children who are really short, the children yes. who are really tall, if the uh -huh. child has any problem with high sugars or low mm -hmm. sugars, high mm -hmm. calcium, low calcium. And the most important, if a child is born and the parents are not sure it's a baby boy and baby girl yes. because of some genital ambiguity, mm -hmm. this is also mm -hmm. in the domain of pediatric endocrinology. So it's oh, a big okay. field. We're just covering a lot of hormonal problems in the children. Right. So And then and then sort of a corollary of that, then diabetes is also then a hormone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hormone is de diabetes is definitely a hormonal problem because yes. insulin is a hormone and... Uh, a pediatric endocrinology is one of the most common referral to us is basically mm. a pediatric diabetes which we are yeah. dealing at the moment yeah. that is one of the most common referral hmm. so I, I do think that and again as this is your specialization do you think that a lot of people don't can, don't think that children can get diabetes and so a lot of times their symptoms go ignored or people think it's something else but it's actually diabetes yeah I mean you're absolutely right because the first thing that which I personally struggled when a child came to us with a diabetes the parents are really in a state of denial uh, the problem is that the duration of symptom, it only lasts for a few weeks or a few months. So it is not like they're having a symptoms for quite a long time. Okay. The most common mm. symptoms are like they really want to drink a lot. They're mm. feeling thirsty. They're peeing a lot. They really want to urinate a lot. And yeah. they start losing weight because of, uh, without any reason actually. Mm. And then at the same time, they're feeling lethargy, tiredness. And sometimes the children start feeling hungry. In spite of that, they're not putting on weight. Ah. And so I think on this platform, we can use this platform for a message. Please, if anyone of your child has has a complaint of increased urination, mm. feeling thirsty because of no reason, and at the same time, he's losing weight for no reason, you need to consult a physician to check at least a blood glucose. Mm. Because, Mina, this type 1 diabetes symptom, they last for a few weeks, a few months. Mm. It is quite different from type 2 diabetes, yes. which can present asymptomatically sometime uh -huh. and which can present with a long history of this polyuria, increased urine mm. and increased thirst. And I'm very, very like, uh, I know I'm sharing a really scary thing over there. No, no, that, it's not because like, sometimes we have to 50, talk about scary 50 things. Fifty 50% of the children with type 1 diabetes, they are presenting in our hospital in a life-threatening complication of type 1 diabetes, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. Oh, gosh. I know it is difficult to prevent mm. it because the parents had no idea that mm. their child is having diabetes, but they need to understand if their child is having a diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, we need to treat it as soon as possible. Yeah. Otherwise, the consequences could be something really alarming like yes. DKA and uh, which should be managed aggressively. So, Dr. Sumro, if uh, parents don't have, if, if one doesn't have a family history of type 1 diabetes or maybe any kind of diabetes, um, so I think what I'm basically thinking of is that a lot of these symptoms that Dr. Aftab mentioned, you know, like, um, you know, being thin, but being hungry all the time. And a lot of times, you know, as a parent, one would think, oh, maybe you just have worms. Or if you drink a lot of water, then you pee a lot. Oh, that's because you were drinking a lot of water. And we don't have a family history of diabetes. So how do you know that this is something that's not normal? You know, well, the thing is that for me, it's actually a change in what the child is normally like. So mm -hmm. sometimes you've got a child who's always been slim, you know, but actually has a good appetite, eats well, is growing, isn't losing weight, right? Yeah. Whereas as Dr. Sumaya said, one of the things that you really worry about is a child who is losing weight. You know, mm -hmm. so with most, most of us, if we have kids who are eating well, they're not getting thinner. They're actually growing. That's true. The other thing that I see a lot... <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that I also see a lot is because I do bedwetting clinics. So, ah. you know, when you have a child who's actually been toilet trained, yeah, and, um, you know, as Dr. Samaya was saying, you know, in type 1 diabetes, um, you know, you'll get increased urination, increased drinking of fluids, and you might get a child who was previously dry at night who suddenly starts bedwetting again. Oh. Um, or a child who is toilet trained in the daytime 
who suddenly starts having accidents in the daytime. Mm. So oh. for me, that's always a little bit of a red flag, you know, yeah. that um, a child who was previously dry for at least six months, who suddenly starts having problems again, I would always check for diabetes. Ram tried to I'm like, is anyone wetting the bed in my family? <laughs> no, but actually, I think these are really important uh, things to notice because, you know, with children, it's tricky because, you know, as parents, we aren't that informed yeah, exactly. about these sort of medical symptoms. And I feel that that's also important to be, to have regular checkups with your pediatrician, yeah. even like well baby checkups, well -baby check sort of every yeah. six months to kind of see what's, yeah, what's, what's going the on. situation. We're going to take a very quick break here and come back to this fascinating conversation about diabetes and kiddos. Stay with us. Welcome back to the coffee table. We're talking about diabetes in children, also known as a juvenile diabetes. I like to say the term, it makes me sound fancy. And we're talking to Dr. Samaya Aftab and Dr. Tanya Sumro, pediatricians extraordinaire. <laughs> but you are, it's not funny. That's true. <laughs> so Dr. Aftab, do you, we were talking about this, and Pakistan apparently has a very high um, incidence of diabetes. Do you think that generally, yeah. but do you think that's because it's increasing or that reporting is better now? Uh, even still, if I'm going to talk about the Pakistan, mm. we do not have any central registry yeah. for diabetic patients. So what I had a feeling that we are under-reporting a lot of type 1 diabetes. Mm. Because if you're looking at the most recently reported incidences, that is basically center-based. Like, I'm reporting my center and someone yeah. reporting its center. They said, like, it might be 1 to 2 person or 1 to 2 per 100,000, which is honestly, it's not a true sort mm. of an image. But yes, you're right. If you're going to talk about the start of the 20th century, it yep. was considered as a rare disease, but now yeah. it's looked that it's becoming more prevalent. So talking about the exact incidence in Pakistan, we don't have a right answer mm. because mm. it is very underreported. There's no central registry with the government. Really need to think about because mm. if you really want to have a good insight of what's actually going on, yeah. we need to have a proper registry for that. Huh, yeah. Because then I feel like that's where then we are able to kind of make better policy decisions, yeah, better health exactly. care kind of management happens. But I do agree with you, Mina, because if I'm going to talk about about 10 years back or two huh. year, 20 years back, the people has no much orientation about what is type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. But now they're getting more oriented. We are receiving a lot of referral from different cities, huh. from pediatrician, which is very really good for me. Yeah. They are now realizing that this is a special disease, a different mm. disease, and a special doctor is assigned to manage it because management of type 1 diabetes is totally different as compared to type 2. Yes. And you need to, and other myth which about type 1 diabetes is that my child can't eat something. Yes. I just want to give us some positive picture about type yes. 1 diabetes. <laughs> also, the children with type 1 diabetes, if you're managing properly, yeah. they can have a normal life. Hmm. Um, hmm. Unfortunately, it's not curable at the moment, but hmm. it is treatable. Hmm. And you can eat anything if you want, but if you know how to eat it. So this ah, is most important. Right. So for example, if someone want to have a treat in a form of a dessert, yes. if they know how to cover the carbohydrate in that dessert, he ah. can enjoy that dessert. Yeah. So when the parents came to me, they were like, oh, my, my, my child is not going to eat sweet throughout the life. So exactly, I was like, like no more birthday yeah, cake for you exactly. forever. Yeah. So I was like, please, he can enjoy everything mm. he can, but you need to learn how to do it. It needs a lot of intensive education. Mm. And but um, I'm, I'm very happy to share my data that honestly, all of my patients, when they started, they were in a state of a panic, anxiety. But after a couple of months, they know more than me. Oh, my, Ooh, if, well, if my child wants to take this, uh -huh. you need this one of an insulin unit. So, and uh -huh. I feel really proud of them at that point. That's I achieved okay. something. <laughs> they know more than me because this is their kid. They are dealing with him daily, so they know Quite more right. than me. Oh, that's so yeah. good. Yeah, well done, so parents. Is... <laughs> so, Dr. Suma, I'm sort of wanting to ask you something piggybacking on this. Is that when a diagnosis is made, what do parents need to be aware of, of, of how to manage um, the, the disease because if, for example, if the average age that you get diagnosed is between five and, and eight or ten, that's you. That's a, that's a young child, and it's difficult to kind of explain I'm to sorry, them. I'm interrupting over yes. here because now the type one diabetes we are seeing the cases from the age of six month. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, wow. is, after the age of six month, if your child is having a diabetes, you start thinking of type one diabetes, and we are seeing a lot of cases under age of five years and the incidence is gradually increasing. We Ooh. don't know the reason and apparently even in the UK there's a university, Exeter mm. University, who is doing a specific study on study on that why the diabetes is getting more prevalent in the children less than five years. Good because God! This concept is and how do you yeah. diagnose in such a... Oh, blowing my mind, Dr. Aftab. <laughs> <Just like, laughs> but yes, Tanya, how does one manage with like a five-year-old and you have to sort of 
manage their diet, for example, and kind of, and then obviously they need insulin injections as well. Like it all seems a bit daunting. It's really daunting, actually. And you know, the thing is that I feel like for most parents, any diagnosis of a chronic disease is really overwhelming, mm. right? And for something like diabetes, you know, particularly type one, what most parents immediately think of is, oh my God, but what about the injections? And, you know, as Dr. Sumaya was saying, they're, you know, worried about the diet, that what will yeah. my child eat? And I feel like actually one of the most important things is, first of all, not to show your anxieties in front of your kids, mm -hmm. you know? I think that that's very essential. And I think that, you know, speaking to your doctor, speaking to your endocrinologist, particularly actually finding other parents who are in the same situation as you, you mm -hmm. know, so who have children with uh, type 1 diabetes, because as Dr. Sumaya was saying, the parents become very good at handling, you know, their children's um, problems and just sort of adjusting insulin doses, looking at the diet, seeing what wow. to do when kids are sick and having a supportive, you know, like a, a family who've been through the same thing, that can really help parents. Hmm. Do you think that some are more at risk of getting juvenile diabetes than others? Um, I mean, definitely with type 1, as I was saying, there's the genetic um, hmm. Hmm. element of it, yes. right? Um, there is definitely an environmental aspect to it, and we're not mm. sure what that is, whether it's some sort of viral infection or some nutritional factor. There is some other reason that is causing that increase in, um, you know, in the number of cases we're seeing. Mm. And for type 2 diabetes, obviously, it's, you know, the, one of the most important things is weight. So yes. when we have kids who are overweight and kids who have a family history of type 2 diabetes, you know, um, those kids are at higher risk. And we would start from the age of 10, we would mm. start just keeping an eye on them, you know, keeping an eye on them, keeping an eye on their HbA1c levels mm. to mm. make sure that, you know, they're staying in control. Ha, huh. so I, I'm for making the segue to type two for me. I love the intelligent guests on the show, make my life much easier. <laughs> so if we're talking about type two diabetes in children, that's a completely different ball game now yeah. because basically what's happening is that you are making insulin, your pancreas is yeah. producing it, but it's sort of like not really working anymore. It's kind of the insulin is just kind of yeah. lost its potency, so to speak. Yeah. And weight has a very big important role, important role to risk play. factor actually for ha. type two diabetes. Ha. And I think I agree with Dr. Somra as she said that previously we th we were thinking that type two diabetes is not appearing in the children. Mm. It's not a problem of the children, and yeah. but now we can see since 2016, the childhood obesity is considered as epidemic. And in mm. Pakistan, it is r rapidly increasing. And we are seeing more and more number of type 2 diabetes in the children. So she's absolutely oh right. Yeah, we are Why seeing are kids getting so overweight? There are a number of reasons. Ah. Number one common causes, I think, is TV time, mm. screen time. And if you, if you religiously follow the WHO recommendation, I think we can achieve a lot of things. But What is the recommendation? Uh, apparently, what they feel that if you really want to prevent obesity in the mm. children, what you need to do, please reduce the screen time of their children. It means if a child is less than two years, yeah. there should be no screen time. Mm. After the age of two years, just yeah. less than one hour till the age of five years. And after the age of five years, just less than two hours. Now, just imagine how much our kids are watching TVs. <laughs> and, and regarding the... And hopefully, no child is watching this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, and but that, yeah, no. Yeah, that's very important. And the second aspect is the sleep time. Oh. Um, they feel that we should allow our children to have a very good sleep time if you really want to prevent obesity. Uh, like, sometimes the children used to come to my clinic, I was like, what is your daily schedule? And I was yeah. shocked to know that they're going to the school from 8 to 3, and after that, there's a carissa waiting for them. Mm. And after that, they are going to some sort of tuitions and yeah. studies. And I was like, okay, so you are having a sedentary lifestyle throughout the day. And yeah. after that, the parents are offering them a treat because they had done a very good day. That's they have been studying in you the know? form of desserts <laughs> and all this stuff. So I think we need to think about our lifestyle, actually, yeah. because there's no physical activity in the children's life. And the sleep time has reduced a lot because uh, if I'm going to talk about a children less than two years, they should enjoy at least 14 to 16 hours of the sleep. Wow, that's a yeah. lot of sleeping. And after the age of yeah. like um, uh, two years to five years, they should enjoy minimum about 10 to 14 hours of the sleep. Mm. So the sleep time is really important. And when I say the sleep sleep time, it means a proper night sleep yeah. without interruptions. Ah. And the third so is definitely of... diet. <laughs> and diet. And yes. physical activity. And, and diet is also a really sort of effective way of managing any kind of diabetes yeah, yeah. as well. And Mina, the, the thing is that the most important is not the amount of food you are taking in. It's also about the 
quality of the food and I must say the what type of the food you're consuming mm. because the, most of the parents they have no idea for example one of the parents they came to me and they said my child is eating nothing no yeah. chapati no roti and I was yeah. like okay can you please bring a food diary but then I realized do you know that this single can of coke it is equivalent to two and three chapatis they were like oh we have no idea yeah. this single brownie or a cupcake means your child has taken two or three rotis do you have mm. this idea mm. then they, we realized that a lot of the problem in the type and choices of the food other mm. than the amount of the food mm. so this is important and physical activity of course we need to increase the physical activity yeah and a lot of times like recommendations for managing diabetes yeah. is losing weight losing weight and getting yeah. exercise and drinking a lot of water so dr sumro let's say that um and I think the Dr. Afzab also mentioned this, is that a lot of uh, type 1 diabetes goes undiagnosed for a very long time. So what can happen if your, if your child hasn't been diagnosed at the right time? Like what's, what's the word, what, what can happen if your diabetes goes undiagnosed? Well, the thing is that, is that uh, you know, with type 1 diabetes, it isn't a long time. So as Dr. Samaya mm. was saying, it's, you know, days to weeks, really, wow. you know, at the time. Whereas it's type 2 diabetes that can go, usually, you know, it's often asymptomatic and can be picked up on just incidental, you know, urine tests mm. or blood tests that you get done. But with type 1, you know, a lot of kids, kids are very obviously unwell because mm. over that period, they will be losing weight, they will be drinking more, they will be peeing more. And the worrying thing is that, you know, um, a lot of those kids will actually present to us in, in diabetic ketoacidosis, which is the life-threatening illness that Dr. Sumaya had mentioned earlier as well. What is that? Uh, uh, that is basically, you know, where what happens is that in your body, because you don't have insulin, you mm. have glucose that's in your blood, mm. but your insulin is what actually moves the glucose from your bloodstream into your cells where you can use it. You know, you mm. can use it for energy, you can use it to store as fat. Yeah. When you have type 1 diabetes and you don't have that insulin, you can't move that glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. Hmm. So the, the glucose stays in the blood, the blood sugar is high, but your cells can't use it. Yeah. Um, and because your blood sugar is high, you start peeing it out, you pee more, you actually get dehydrated mm. and you start to lose weight because you're having to use other sources of energy. Yeah. And when you start to break down your fats, that's what actually produces you know, the state in your body that we call keep diabetic ketoacidosis. Oh gosh. And is... Does that present itself a certain way? Because I know that I think one of the indications is that your breath smells fruity. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, kids with, with DKA I know. are very sick, one, you know. Hmm. So those are the ones that come in, you know, they're the ones that we're always, you know, as a, I'm a general pediatrician, obviously Dr. Sumaya is a, an endocrinologist, but as a general pediatrician, those are the ones that we are the most worried about. You know, hmm. they come in, they're often, you know, in a coma or almost comatose. They're very, very sick. God, they're in a coma. And the interesting thing is mm. that like 40 and 50 percent of the children with type 1 diabetes, huh. they first presented with DKA. And Mina, oh it's my not God. like in Pakistan, even while I was working mm. in UK and in other part of the world, the problem is the same because uh. the parents have no idea that their child is going through mm. something called diabetes. Yes. But as uh, Dr. Sumro said very well, that if you feel that your child is weeing a lot for a couple of days and at the same time he's having any difficulty in breathing, if you feel he's smelling something different, mm. if you have any concern that he's not well oriented yeah. please go to the hospital because uh, DK is a life threatening complication but mm. it is uh, treatable we can save a life of a child if the child reached timely mm. um, um, for me like if we are seeing about like 50 or 60 patients of diabetic ketoacidosis in a one month uh, I think uh, maybe 80 to 90 percent we are saving and these children okay. are going back home hmm, few so, yeah but mm. few of them are those who presented very really late actually they are in a state of denial they said no my child is not having a diabetes they are mm. going to a different hospital because someone declared that this is a diabetic patient uh. we need to start insulin so please do not get scared of it because yeah. all the doctors and all the staff are there to just save the life of your child actually right. yeah. Yeah. do you feel that uh, you get patient you get parents who are resistant to the idea definitely definitely but i don't blame them actually mm. because being a parent it is very really normal to accept a big diagnosis of a chronic ailment and this is a moment when you really need to support your patient and family so many times i used to tell my patients please take your time but 
Let come me back. banish. Let <laughs> me banish the patient at the same time. Do not stop insulin. Mm. If you want to take a second opinion, you have a full right to take a second opinion. Yeah. The first thing which I feel about the parents is start blaming themselves. Mm. Uh, so they feel, oh, because my child is eating a lot of carbs and mm. he enjoyed certain parties which is containing sugary fruits mm. and sugary juices and stuff, it might be responsible. I saw the parents fighting in the clinic. Yeah. Oh, you asked the child yeah. to eat all the stuff. Quite right. So, so at yeah. that point, I, we really need to support them that please, 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 type 1 diabetes is not related to the carbohydrate intake before mm. diabetes. Mm. It is something which runs in the genetic makeup yeah. and somehow some environmental factor trigger it. Mm. If you're going to ask me what is the one cause for it, I am unable to pinpoint. Yeah. Even a lot of research has been going on how to prevent type 1 diabetes. Mm. We cannot prevent type 1 diabetes at the moment. Yeah. But here, maybe I'm very, I'm very positive person. Maybe in the near future, we can come up with certain answers. Yeah. But yes, the parents are not supposed to get blamed. It's not, right. mm. it's not because of the parents, it's not because of the sweets, it's not because of the candies, mm. it is not because of the weight even. Yeah. Because sometimes we know that because of increased incidence of obesity, that obese child can also have type 1 diabetes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it is not related to the weight. Huh. A thin or obese, anyone can have type 1 diabetes, mm. so they need to understand that. Mm. Well, I think that's very yeah. important because yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's true and I think that even generally with diabetes, yeah. when we think about it, it's like, oh, well, you know, you ate a lot of sugar when you were a child, that size, an older yeah. person, you got it. But that's just simply not true. Yeah, so, not true. what other uh, treatments are there at the moment? It has this sort of, I'm sure it's yeah, improving yeah, yeah. day by day with research to kind of manage type 1, let's say, diabetes. I mean, I'm managing type 1 diabetes is if you want to ask me a single answer is insulin yes and <laughs> it's definitely insulin at the moment but mm. you need to decide about how to give insulin actually yeah. uh, we normally used to give shots of insulin mm -hmm. daily depending mm. upon how your child is going to eat and what amount of carbohydrate in the meal is yeah and now there are different ways to give insulin mm. some are giving insulin in the form of injections some yeah. are using pens uh, there are pumps available uh, okay. even the pumps are available in Pakistan but they're okay. very expensive actually uh, uh. so uh, this is how the the treatment is but so it's, what's a pump? Like it's a little device that gets yeah, fitted to you. Yeah, it is a you. little device that is somehow attached to your body and yep. it is continuously giving insulin to your child. Hmm. But again in a pump, if you need, to, if your child want to eat something, you need to somehow put certain values at how much carbohydrate my, my child is going oh. to eat so it can adjust the dose ah. and give that bolus. Ah. Uh, even I think the pump look very fancy in Pakistan, but before moving to the pump, the patient should have and their parents should have very intensive education. Quite because right. in the end, it's mm. a device. Yeah. So if there's a device failure, you need to know how to move back to your pens, which no, is the basic. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. also, this also sounds like there's there. It, this requires a great yeah. deal of awareness about meal a planning lot, and diet lot, management. Yeah. And even in a, even UK, where the patient were having the pump, they were having continuous support system, 24 yeah. by 7, by the nurses, by the doctor, and by the company who is applying the pump. So you, we oh, need to understand the company too. We need to understand yeah. what is going to happen yes, in the Pakistan. We do not have such system actually. Yeah, that we need a whole yeah. infrastructure. And yeah. I we're think going. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. we're going to take a very quick break here and come back to this fascinating conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back to the coffee table and this riveting discussion about juvenile diabetes and you know all the wonderful things that one can do to treat it. And I, I realize that saying wonderful in diabetes in the same sentence sounds a bit odd, but you know there is hope and actually there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of myths about this also. We're just going to talk about them in one second with Dr. Tanya Sumro and Dr. Samaya Aftab, who are pediatricians. And Dr. Aftab is a pediatric endocrinologist. So, you know, we've got a very good panel for you. <laughs> so, Dr. Sumro, if, um, you know, we were talking about diet plans before the break and how, in, you know, children and parents need to be very aware of what the child is eating in order to sort of be able to know, you know, how you need to adjust your insulin sort of day by day. Um, what are sort of common myths that you find kind of percolating amongst the parents that come to you about diabetes? I mean, I think, I think one of them is that people think that you really have to be completely obsessive about what your child can eat and can't eat. Ah. And I feel that, you know, as long as you have a healthy, balanced diet, which is mm. what every child should be having, huh. you know, a healthy, balanced diet and have scheduled meals. So your kids have, you know, it's, it's important for all kids to have a routine. 
routine. But it's especially important for kids with, you know, type 1 diabetes to have a routine. So their meals should be scheduled. You know, I would normally say three meals and three snacks. Hmm. Because if you schedule your meals, then you can also have a better idea in terms of your insulin dosage, you know, huh. when you're going to give it, how much you need to give. Hmm. Um, not to skip meals, because that ends up being a real problem, you know, with your insulin if you skip a meal. Huh. So I would say that, you know, one of the things parents say is that they'll say things like, oh, you know, my child can't have rice or potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parents think that their kids can't have any carbohydrates. And that's completely wrong. You know, mm -hmm. kids actually need carbohydrates yeah. because if they don't have carbohydrates, their blood sugar will fall too low because yeah. they are taking insulin. Huh, huh. So and I would say that, look, you know, stick to healthy, healthy meal choices, meat, chicken, fish, grains, vegetables, fruit. Um, I would just say no sugary drinks, sugary sweet drinks, and, mm -hmm. you know, limit the fruit juices, which is what I would say to every child. That's true, actually. That's a really interesting distinction here, because... To, to me, it sounds like a, a type 1 diagnosis doesn't mean that the child's life is, you know, sort of, God forbid, compromised in a really serious way. Because this sounds like advice all children should be following in any case. Yes, exactly. You know, and the thing is that, yes, in terms of, you know, sweet desserts, if you... If you want to have a sweet dessert, you can have it and adjust your insulin dosage. But as we would say to any parent, you know, try not to give your kids too many sweet things. You know, reduce the amount of, you know, chocolate sweets, cakes, pastries, processed foods that you yeah. would give. Yeah. So I would say, you know, a fresh, varied diet, limiting the processed foods, limiting the saturated fats, yeah. which would be my advice for anyone. Yeah, quite right. And the reason why I'm kind of thinking about this is that it seems like... Um, and of course, you know, you 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 treat type patients with type one diabetes. That if you manage your type one, even your type two, but since we're talking yeah. about type one, if you manage your diabetes well, yeah. then the quality of your life is not unlike anybody else's. Yeah, I think uh, this is this is a very pertinent question because most of the parents they start talking be like, can can we send a kid to the schools actually mm. because he's diagnosed with type one diabetes? Yeah. Can my child participate in some physical activity? So please, if the type one diabetes is properly managed, these children can have a normal life, mm. a normal life expectancy. See, they can enjoy mm. everything, but again, they need to get a proper education how to deal with different situation. Yeah. I mean, there are different guidelines. If mm. your child wants to do an exercise, what you need to do? You need to check your blood glucose, mm. if how much is this, how to give a snack. So everything is in black and white. We always teach the parents about this. Mm. Similarly, if what is the guidance for the school? The school should have a proper glucometer. They should know how to treat a hypoglycemia if it yeah. happened at the school. Mm -hmm. So being mm -hmm. a doctor, it is a responsibility that if we are dealing with any child with type 1 diabetes, we need to coordinate with the school, let them know that this patient is a type 1 diabetic. If you have any features related to hypoglycemia, uh. that is a low sugar, uh. you need to treat it actually. Don't ignore it. But it is manageable. The children all over the world, they were having a normal life. Yeah. It's But again, the, everything is not just insulin again. It's an intensive education. And when mm -hmm. I say intensive, education it means intensive because I normally spend like hours of an hours with my patient and sometimes like they in initial few weeks they are calling like maybe 15 to 20 times Quite because right. when they go back because, home uh, they are concerned about each and everything and also I feel like I don't know how it is in the rest of the world but here I think that culturally we're very hesitant to discuss ailments yeah. especially when it comes to our children because there's this feeling that there's something wrong with yeah. them and you don't want people to know and that kind of guilt that you mentioned exactly before which is not helpful and especially anybody. the family pressure which is there's mm. a lot of family pressure because in Pakistan we used to live as a joint family yeah. and the problem is that the other kids were eating their stuff so somehow I somehow I cannot uh, ask my child not to go for that yeah, and yeah. some other one in the family who said oh no no don't worry just he can eat everything without insulin so please allow him to eat yeah that that's stuff. simply not scientifically so, true exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but also uh, do you get parents who are nervous that their other children might have it but diabetes is yeah they, that is definitely one of the major concern about the uh -huh. parents that okay we got a child with a diabetes and how to prevent my rest of the kids from being a type 1 diabetic mm -hmm. so uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Somro said yeah. that definitely there is a genetic 
genetic background for mm. that. They, there's a slightly increased risk of having a children with type 1 diabetes in other one. But if you're going to ask me how to prevent it, the answer is simply a no. At the moment, we cannot prevent it, but the risk is very low. It's it very is low. not like that, that if you have one child with diabetes, then in every child is going to have type 1 diabetes. It's mm. very rare, actually. Mm. Mm. So, uh, so it's that is unlikely. why I used to tell them in a very positive way, yes. it is very less likely to have your kid to have a type 1 diabetes. Huh. It's less like the same incidence as the Anybody other kids else. can expose to. So huh. don't get worried about this. That's but I know being a parent, they start checking the blood glucose sometimes. They start getting certain antibodies to huh. make it sure that, oh, my child is having this antibodies. Should I go for further screening or not? Mm. So mm. this is the issue. And also because I feel maybe because type 1 is autoimmune yeah. and we don't know why autoimmune conditions happen, exactly. there's a lot of sort of ideas around it that maybe if you wean between four months and seven months, if you wean between in that window, then it's okay. But if you sort of delay it or you make it too early, yeah. then you might have, or then you might develop it later on yeah, in I mean, life. Yeah, because what happened all over the world, a number of studies has been going on that how we can prevent autoimmunity and they identified the few risk factors. They feel mm. that these are the risk factors. We observe that if we have this risk factor, the child is more prone to get type 1 diabetes or other autoimmune as you would rightly said that if you are going to wean before the age of six months might be your child is more prone to get autoimmune diseases mm. similarly introdu introducing cow milk early to your child could be one of the risk factor vitamin D deficiency somehow linked to mm. type 1 diabetes mm. and then certain viruses infections which we believe could provoke to type 1 diabetes mm. but definitely they are one of the few risk factor I cannot blame one of them to yeah. be a cause yeah. of type yeah. 1 diabetes and none of them has been kind of you know sort of concretely yeah. definitively proven to be like yes this is a direct link yeah. here. So but I think these are the few norms. The weaning should be started at the, after the age of six months. So this is something which is which should be practiced even in a normal child, yeah. in which we are not suspecting type 1 diabetes. Right. The cow milk should be introduced after the age of one year. Yeah. So yeah. these are few things which are very really norms, I think. Yeah. And I think uh, we can practice them being a normal parent to our kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah which, so. Again, that sort of same thing that Dr. Sumo is also mentioning, that a lot of the dietary recommendations are ones that you would just have for any child regardless. Exactly. Even the vitamin D mm. deficiency should not be in any kid. They should yeah, have the supplement right. proper vitamin Everybody's D. Everybody's vitamin D should be like, you know, A+. Plus. <laughs> Dr. Sumba was wondering that because type 1 is an autoimmune condition, does that mean that your child's general immunity is compromised as well? Well, so there are two, there are two, th two parts to that question, actually, Mina. Mm. One is that when your child, that you're right that type 1 is an autoimmune condition, and when you have type 1, so when you have actually any autoimmune condition, you are at higher risk of having any of the other autoimmune conditions. Okay. So if we have a child who's a newly diagnosed uh, diabetic and diagnosed mm -hmm. with type 1 diabetes, then we would always, as a matter of routine, check for other autoimmune conditions. So we would mm -hmm. check for celiac disease. We check for thyroid problems. We would check, you know, maybe think about things like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory mm -hmm. bowel disease, any of these other things. You know, you'd have a higher... Uh, index of suspicion for them. Huh. The other, the other part of the question, which was that you know, with type one diabetes, are you at higher risk of infection? And you are definitely at higher risk of infection okay. with type one diabetes. Mm. And you are at higher risk. You know, so let's say particularly in um, in older adults, there might be issues with wound healing, hmm. or that when we have kids who come in with type one diabetes, that you know they may actually have infections at the time when they present, or it may be an infection that kind of triggers you know the illness getting worse. Hmm. So there is a higher risk of illness. And the other thing to be aware of is that even if you have a child who's completely stable on their insulin who is, you know, the diet is all sorted, the insulin is mm. sorted. Mm. When that child gets sick, and kids do get sick, no. when you get sick, your insulin requirement increases. Oh. And obviously, you know, all of us, any of us who have kids know that when you have a child who's sick, suddenly their predictable diet goes out the window, right? Like yes. maybe they're not eating as much as uh, they normally uh. do, or maybe they're vomiting. And all of that is going to play havoc with your insulin requirements and your blood sugar. So it's very important when your child gets sick to be in even closer contact mm. with your doctors, you know, wow. to make sure that actually your child isn't getting worse and that the diabetes doesn't start getting worse at that mm. time. Mm. No, I think that's extremely useful. So Dr. Afsab, do you get parents who ask you that, you know, what if we don't give our child insulin? What will happen? Yeah. So I think this is... Which essentially means yeah, you're not treating the condition. Especially those parents who are in a phase of denial, mm. they feel that the child does not have a type 1 diabetes and they most commonly ask, okay, if we are not going to give 
insulin, then, then what next actually? So you need to tell the pa pa patient and the parents that your child is totally deprived of insulin at the moment. So you need to understand there is no insulin and really little insulin in the body. So if you're not gonna give insulin, I am afraid we might end up in a &E emergency in a really life-threatening condition, which Dr. Somro has already uh, explained yes, very the, well. the key to acidosis. Key to acidosis yes. And which could be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. So you need to realize your parents, please start insulin as soon as possible. And is there other sort of like long-term effects so the on long -term, the body yeah. in other organs as yeah, well? I mean, like if you're not, going to properly treat type 1 diabetes mm. like some certain parents they were like okay we are missing injections sometimes we are not giving properly the blood glucose are running high then like other condition like other type of diabetes it do affect your eyes mm. it do affect your kidneys it do affect your joints and you can have a problem with your heart you can have a problem with your cholesterol level you can have mm. a problem with your blood pressure so definitely these are the complications and this is the reason after the age of like 10 and 11 years when their diabetes duration is more than two to five years we start screening them for this complication so ah. every patient with type 1 diabetes, when they come to our clinic, we do an annual review, hmm. which include the eye examination and the kidney assessment hmm. and the heart assessment, the blood pressure, the cholesterol level and the association other for other autoimmune disease, as yes. Dr. Somro has mentioned. Yes. So definitely these are the risk factors. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a lifelong condition that yeah, needs to be managed throughout exactly. your life. And as an adult, then you do exactly. it yourself. But parents need to be taking it quite Se seriously. seriously. Exactly. Hmm. It's a very somber note to end the show on, but it's really important to keep having these conversations, I feel, so that other parents don't feel so alone and that there are a lot of exactly. people out there. I think in this way, the we need to really motivate the parents also that mm. please, you're not alone. Uh, so fortunately in Pakistan, there are a number of peer support group. There's a one group, yeah. Meet Zindagi, which is playing uh. a very good role, a very marvelous role. Yeah. And the CEO is basically herself, but she's a very young lady and she's yeah. herself a type 1 diabetic patient. Yeah. So what she did, she make a group of all the parents who, who children were having type 1 diabetes. That's so they Wonderful. can have a chit chat. Yes. Yeah. And so they can discuss their fears. That's very small thing. Sometimes they cannot approach a doctor, but they can discuss with each other. Quite right. And, yes. And to also show that, you know, you can have a perfectly good, exactly. happy, healthy life Fine. where and you manage this condition. And especially and, you know, when you know that organization CEO herself is having a type 1 diabetes and she yeah. is, mashallah, running a very, very good organization. Yeah. You feel very motivated. You can set certain example in front of them. And like I normally used to say to my parents, like some of my cousins were having type 1 diabetes. Mm. My friends were having type 1 diabetes. Diabetes, yeah. and they were diagnosed as early as the age of two years and three uh, years and they uh. were having better life than me. <laughs> They got better grades and they, everything. They were, they were earning better than me. They were having better life than me. So, but they know how to manage their diabetes. Yeah. yeah, which is great. I think you know awareness is the key thing. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Thank Aftab. So much. Thank you, Dr. Sumer, for being on the show with me today. I have learned so many things. Um, it's it's clearly um, a scary diagnosis initially, but with type one diabetes, there is so many um, there are so many avenues for treatment, and there's every um, there, there's no reason why your child can't have a very full filled healthy life even with this diagnosis and clearly there are lots of wonderful doctors here to help you out thank you so much for watching the show if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you next time on the coffee table bye now